Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. This one took longer than I thought it would. It even ended up being longer than I thought it would too. Sorry. It's been quite a busy month. I moved recently and have had a lot to sort out. On the plus side though, I now live with a cat. He's very sweet and likes to get involved in videos too. Anyway, rank 5 is quite condensed, but there's a lot of things I'd like to get into, so feel free to watch it in parts as it is still a long one. Also, I would absolutely recommend watching the previous videos if you haven't already, as there are a fair few callbacks for context. Also, a huge thank you to everyone who's used my decal affiliate link so far. I'm glad people are having fun with it. With the extra support from this link, I'm planning on buying a better audio setup for my flat. I record these voiceovers right now in my lunch break at work in the office, which can get a bit difficult. So I'd like to get something similar at home so I can record these faster in my own time. So if you'd like to get something slightly cheaper in the store, support me and pick up the decal too. The link will be in the description. Thank you. Anyway, long intro aside, thanks for being here. And as always, I really hope you enjoy. So first off today, we have one of the strangest looking ground vehicles, the M50 Ontos, which loosely translates to thing in Greek, which is quite apt as there's nothing really in the game that looks quite like this thing. It's visually pretty unique, and as well, it's functionally quite unique too. This thing has six 105mm recoilless rifles strapped to the sides. They're labelled as 106mm, but they are actually 105s. The 106 designation was just used so that it wasn't accidentally equipped with the wrong ammunition. These are very different to the standard 105 guns common at this tier though, and only fire two shells. A heat round, which can get through a massive 433mm of armour, and Hesh. These rifles do carry some of the most effective Hesh rounds in the game, able to defeat armour up to 152mm thick, which is pretty good. But we'll go into these rounds in more detail a bit later. Armour, as expected, is nothing to really pay much mind to. It can withstand heavy MGs from the front, but it won't be protecting you against anything else. It does sometimes bounce regular rounds if the angle is steep enough, but in any case, this doesn't factor into gameplay, it's mostly just luck. Mobility is overall pretty good. The Ontos is a TD by designation, but like the Scorpion, it can scout like a light tank, and the mobility it has does let it fill that role. Off-road when spaded, it can cruise in the high 30s to low 40s and accelerates to speed pretty fast. It can only hit 7 in reverse, which isn't too impressive, but it can make its way around the map decently enough. It also has the acceleration to swing the hull around quickly too, which is very much necessary as this thing can't fully traverse the turret. It can only move 40 degrees to either side, which brings us onto probably the most difficult aspect to this vehicle, which is using the guns. Because the guns are offset, they don't fire from the middle of the crosshair, and because each gun is positioned slightly differently, you consistently need to adjust your aim to land your shells accurately. Beyond around 400 meters, the rounds will land centrally to your crosshair, but any closer and you will need to compensate. You can though download some custom sights from War Thunder Live if you're on PC. These sights show the trajectory much clearer, and where the shells will fire from in the scope, which can be pretty useful. The guns fire in the same order every time. The first three shells come from the left and the last three from the right. These guns are all counted collectively as your primary weapon, which means they all function as one single module, every gun will reload at the same time. So effectively, in gameplay terms, you have three clips of ammunition that you can use. Once you've fired off six shots, the next six will load together. The reload is actually very quick for each cycle. Stock, the reload is 16.9 seconds, and on an ace crew, you can get this down to 13 seconds, which is just over 2 seconds per gun. Unusually forgiving, actually. One annoying thing about this though, is that all 6 guns share the same damage model. So if you get clipped in one of your barrels, all 6 of them will break. Kind of tedious, but it's probably just the limitation of how these weapons are coded. It doesn't ruin the vehicle, but it can still feel unfair sometimes. Apart from positioning, one of the biggest choices for this vehicle is which rounds to take. Because it functions as a clip, you can't really mix your rounds. You can't take, say, 8 Hesh rounds and 18 Heat rounds, only 3 total clips of each type. Back in the day, I would have recommended the Hesh as the standout option, but these days the Heat does hit very hard, although it's more a case of the Hesh being nerfed. The Heat on these rifles is much more reliable than the Heat on the T92 or Scorpion for example. Because of the penetration and 1.6kg of explosive filler, this thing does a lot of damage. 
Heat is similar partially to AP in the sense that if a heat shell has 300mm of pen and hits armor 290mm thick, it won't cause quite as much damage as less of the jet is reaching the crew compartment. It's much less pronounced than the AP, but it does share some similarity here, which in any case can make this heat round very reliable. It one-shots ammo very consistently and has a comparatively wide cone of damage. As for Hesh, if you land a Hesh shot well, it can one-shot almost anything. But for tanks with decent frontal armor, you will need a precise shot. If you hit add on armor or side skirts, the round will do absolutely nothing. In general here, I'd say that the Hesh is better at knocking out vehicles that were already easy to knock out, but less reliable against tougher tanks like King Tigers, which are still very common. So in general, I would recommend maining the heat, as you will be able to at least penetrate anything you hit. With an accurate shot, the Hesh is really effective, but because of the offset firing platform of this thing, getting those precise hits isn't always going to be easy. Both have use, I wouldn't say the Hesh is useless, but I would recommend the heat for this BR. As for where to play it, the most important thing is getting the jump on your enemy. Ambushing at close range is definitely where I have the most fun with it. A strong early game rush to a close range area or cap point works really well. You don't want to be caught out when using this thing as it can't really react very well. Because of the offset and the bounciness of the guns, snapshots are very hard to pull off and if an enemy is coming at your side, you'll need to swing the hull around too. The rounds are also fairly low velocity at around 500 meters a second for both, which further cuts into this reaction time. You do have ranging machine guns on top of four of the barrels, but these are only really accurate within around 400 meters, which is pretty easy to aim for anyway. You can still snipe with this thing, as your rounds pen the same at any distance, and at range, your rounds are arguably easier to aim accurately. Another bonus to this is because you have six shots, if your first shell misses, you can follow up a second shot instantly before your enemy can react to you, which is an advantage only a handful of tanks have. But in any case, this thing still works great at close ranges where you can really get the jump on people. So laying in wait with an ambush playstyle is a very reliable way to go, either behind a corner at close range or behind some sort of low cover. This thing does have 10 degrees of gun depression, so you can use ridge lines quite effectively. As this thing doesn't have much turret to shoot at, enemies will sometimes just completely miss you, so it is a good spot to look out for. In general though, try to look out for a very linear sight line and stick to some sort of cover. Out in the open, you are very vulnerable. But because this thing is so small and doesn't look like a normal tank, it can hide around areas of the map most other tanks can't. So even sitting next to a tree or car can give you a couple of extra seconds before you're recognized. Early game, this is definitely the play to make. Setting up next to a well-traveled route is fairly reliable. You will be able to disable literally any vehicle you can meet at this BR, and you can disable multiple vehicles very quickly. So if you can catch the first wave of enemies, you can usually take a few of them out. As for what cover to hide behind, either try to find soft cover like bushes or hard cover that's uniform in shape. If you were to hide part of your hull behind a rock and only poke out part of it, only three of your six guns can fire out of this cover, which can be difficult to work around, especially if an enemy is aware of you. Because of where the site is placed, you can't really side scrape with this thing. In the late game, you can get away with roaming with the Ontos, just rolling around behind enemy lines. It's honestly quite fun just lurking down the back roads of some maps and shotgunning people. It's like one of those wandering spiders. Actually, weird tangent, but my brain really doesn't like it when I play this thing. When I angle the barrels up, I always get reminded of when those Brazilian wandering spiders lift up their legs in that threat display. It always makes me take my feet off the floor. Anyway, despite the difficulty involved with aiming the guns, it's actually quite a forgiving vehicle, as you effectively get six tries at hitting and disabling an enemy if you're fully loaded, which means you can play it safe in regards to getting kills if you're not quite as confident, disabling the breach with the first shot and finishing them off with a follow-up. If you know the locations of ammo racks though, do always aim for them, as this round is very reliable at detonating ammo. And in general actually for most post-war tanks, you can pretty much just aim centre mass. If you can hit the hull of a Leopard, T-54 or IS-3, this round will pop them pretty easily. One final thing to keep in mind is to keep an eye on how many shots you have left. The reload is okay relative to the firepower you have, but it is still long, and you don't want to get caught out, as if you do, this vehicle doesn't really have any fallbacks. If you only have one round left and are in a safe location, fire off the last shot to reload the rest of the guns, just so you're better equipped when you run into an enemy again. Pros. 
Great firepower. Good mobility. And versatile. And the cons. Poor survivability. And poor firing platform. Verdict. I'd get it. It's pretty much up tier proof and works well anywhere if you can stick to cover. I think the T92, also at 6.7, is more versatile and can fill more roles in battle, but the forgiving nature of the Ontos and the reliable damage really gives it a place. I wouldn't say it's objectively better or worse than the T92, it's just sort of challenging in a different way. It's also a kind of silly and fun vehicle, and as it has both ammo types stock, it can be a really nice vehicle to play around with and uses your light tank in various lineups. Next up, back to tradition with a vehicle that probably looks fairly familiar. This is the M46 Patton, very much a successor to the M26 Pershing in the last episode. And I'd comfortably say that if you didn't like the Pershing, you probably will like the Patton, as it improves on a lot of the tedious aspects the Pershing had, most notably the mobility. The M46 comes with an 810 horsepower engine, much more powerful than the 500 the M26 had. It can't reach a higher top speed, but its reactivity and average speed is much higher. This thing cruises in the mid-40s easily off-road. It's also slightly faster in reverse and has neutral steering too. Massive improvement. The armor though remains functionally identical to the M26. Its composition is slightly different and the turret armor is displayed differently, but in terms of actual protection, they're basically the same. So at 7.0, its protection is hardly a strong point, but it is still adequate. You will still bounce shells from some of the weaker guns from time to time. This thing does also get add-on armor, but it's not really worth taking. All it does is add a wire mesh around the turret. This is intended to disrupt heat fuses, but in game, it doesn't completely defeat them. Any common heat shell will still break through the wire mesh and pen your turret. It doesn't even fuse Hesh anymore. So all it really does is slightly increase your weight and make you more noticeable. Firepower has seen some significant improvement as well. You get the standard M82 APHE shell, but it's improved. Like the Scorpion in the last episode, M82 fired by this gun has slightly more pen. Not by much, but it is better. It also gets a couple of useless APCR rounds that are so similar to the point where having both types is completely pointless, but at the end of the chain, it gets an unlockable heat FS shell. It's not great, but it does mean that you have the firepower to break through pretty much all of the armor you can meet. It can only get through a max of 305mm, so it is on the weaker end of heat shells, but it's still a good option to have. It doesn't cause anywhere near the same level of damage as on the Ontos, so, from my perspective, M82 is still the best round to main on most maps, as long as you aren't fully up tiered. And that's really all there is new for the M46. Functionally, it's just a faster Pershing with better rounds. The best way of maintaining your armor protection is still angling and keeping on the move, which is made even easier by the improved mobility. So, we're reaching the point in these reviews where it gets considerably harder to identify a definitive playstyle for these versatile medium tanks and soon-to-be MBTs. They can do everything. There's nothing that actively holds them back at a baseline. Most of what goes into discussing how to use tanks in this game is working out what a vehicle can't do, or rather what a vehicle isn't effective at doing, and using this to work out what you should do. Identify its hard limitations, objective drawbacks, and what kind of playstyles don't work, and whatever remains is fair game. But the issue is that vehicles like this don't really have any disadvantages to mitigate, which makes discussing what it can do quite vague. The vehicle doesn't hold you back in any way really, which gives you a lot of scope in how to play it, which is great, but it does make it very difficult to give concrete advice for. If a tank has awful hull armor and good turret armor, we can say, play a hull down. And knowing this gives you a sort of soft goal in the match to find a location that nullifies this drawback. It's good direction, I guess, to know what your vehicle can't do so that you actively seek out areas that make it work. The danger of a versatile vehicle like this is that it's more likely that you'll end up in a naturally bad spot because nothing about the vehicle is forcing you to pick a better one. And I think this is a really important general thing to keep in mind when using these kinds of tanks. It's easy to get complacent. In lower BRs, we had the Shermans, very much versatile in the same way, but the ratio of vehicles that were barely a threat to you there was much higher. At this BR, anything can get through you if you make even the slightest misplay, so 
even though the playstyle of these tanks is fairly similar, the M46 needs to be approached more carefully. I can't really tell you exactly where to put or how to use this thing. It can work in the best areas of any given map and take out most vehicles easily. So your success really just depends on your base level of ability. If you know good spots, land shots well and know how to react to how a match is going, you can do some really good work with this thing. The only other aspect to the M46 in particular is which round to use. On most maps, I main the APHE and keep the heat as a secondary. The M82 one-shots much easier and can still combat most of the tanks you'll meet. If you run into something heavy like the IS-3 or KTH, try to go for the barrel and then switch to the heat. Its damage output isn't hugely reliable, but it will still pop ammo racks on most tanks. But generally though, with this one, I aim for the crew. Most post-war tanks have quite condensed crew placement, with three of the four in a sort of line. So aiming here on tanks like the Centurions, T-54s and Leopards can be quite reliable one-shots. If you're not quite as confident though, maining the heat when you unlock it is still completely workable. It is a bit harder to secure kills with sometimes and sort of passively slows you down in that regard, but it does mean that you can pen every tank you run into pretty much. Although on very long range maps I would go with the heat as your primary round. Some tanks are very hard to take out with the APHE at range, so in this sort of situation the heat is a really good tool to have. Pros. Good firepower great mobility, and versatile. And the cons? Unreliable armor is really all I can put here. It's barely a con as it doesn't hold the tank back, but it's not exactly a pro either. Verdict is pointless. Get it for sure. It's a hugely workable tank that can do pretty much everything you need it to do. It'll still work in up tiers and can be used on most maps. You can make a nice lineup for 7.0 for sure, especially if you have the T29, but if not, it will still work fine at 732. Next in line, we have the M47, which takes the base platform of the M46 and improves on it in every way. These two tanks are functionally very similar, but the M47 is far more usable. Mobility is basically identical. The M47 is slightly heavier, but not to the point where you'd ever really notice or feel the difference. It's also more reactive regarding firepower as well, as the M47 has a much faster turret traverse. 25.2 seconds with the drive upgrade, which is the same speed as the Bulldog. Really nice for a medium tank. This thing functionally uses the same gun as the Scorpion, so it shares the same main rounds, M82 and the improved Heat FS shell. It does only have 15mm of extra penetration when compared to the heat shell on the M46, but it's the velocity that really makes it stand out. 1,216 meters a second. This is even better for long-range fights, as the M47 comes with the rangefinder modification, making long-range heat very accurate. It also comes with Commander Gunner Control 2. Armor is better, but not really to the point where it's any more reliable. Essentially, all Sabo and heat rounds can get through all of your hull and turret, but it is better against APHE. An average range, if you angle, the long 88 and Russian 100 will bounce on the upper hull and the middle part of the lower plate. There are parts of the hull that aren't strong enough to withstand these rounds, but it will catch poorly placed shots if you rush an enemy into firing. It's essentially the same for the turret as well. These APHE shells can get through the middle and the top of the turret face, but there are parts that still can bounce. Armor isn't really worth dwelling on much though, as you aren't reliably protected against anything. Armor is only really worth actively keeping in mind if you know that you're completely immune in a certain situation to a certain vehicle. Outside of meeting lower tier vehicles that are being purposefully up-tiered, most of the common tanks at this BR will always be a threat to you. But as long as you play it like the previous mediums, keep angled and keep on the move if you're being shot at, the armor will be the best it can be. If you are strafing with an enemy though, always keep your turret pointed directly towards them. The corners of your turret normalize and are a very, very easy pen. As for playstyle, not a huge amount changes, but some options you have are more reliable. Playing at close range with the APHE can be easier due to the increased armor and turret rotation speed, and sniping at long range with the heat can be quite easy too. A benefit of playing hull down as well is that you're very hard to one-shot with heat or sabo. Unlike the M46, the 47 has no ammo in the turret, so a position like this can really increase your survivability while ensuring that you can still penetrate anything. 
In 7.7 and above though, I do usually main the heat with this thing on most maps. On some urban maps and in 7.3 games, you can get a lot of one shots with the APHE, it is still reliable, but the heat does speed up your reaction times. It's very easy to aim, and with this thing's improved reactivity, you can point and click on enemies very quickly and you will get through their armor. At close range, this round has basically no drop, so even though the APHE is workable in this environment, the heat may just be a safer bet. In any case, always take a mix of rounds. If you can disable an enemy with your first shot, a follow-up with APHE, knowing that you have the extra time to aim still works well. Apart from that, it is still a very versatile MBT. No hard downsides to compensate for. Pros. Good firepower. Great mobility. And versatile. The cons. Unreliable armor. Pretty much the same. Verdict is also the same. Get it. The M47 is one of the best vehicles the US gets this tier. It doesn't have the best gun or armor, but it excels in each area enough to work well in any situation. It's a proper workhorse and can do anything you need it to. This one is definitely worth spading. Next up, we have the M48. A strong visual change in design, but doesn't really add much, if anything, over the M47. In game, it's almost a bit of a downgrade, actually. This thing gets the same hesh round the Scorpion had, and similarly starts off with terrible APCR. You'll want to go for at least M82 as fast as possible here. It does also have a rangefinder and commander gunner control, but does lose the fast turret traverse. The M48 is 2.5 tons heavier than the 47, so it is noticeably more sluggish. Top speed is almost the same, but it does accelerate slower and traverses slower as well. It's still able to do anything it needs to do, but it's noticeably not quite as good. The reverse speed is also only half as effective at only 8 kph. This is an issue as its armor is not really very effective either. A lot of the parts of the armor are stronger, but the armor itself is less vague than the M47 in the sense that the weak points are more obvious and as such easier to hit. Any APHE shell around this BR can get through the lower plate very easily as well as the turret ring and the sides of the turret from the front. At average ranges, guns like the Long 88, the Russian 100 and 122 can break through the turret in these spots very easily, and as the M48 only has four crew, one shots are far more likely. It does have a more pronounced cupola as well, but this rarely fuses APHE. Most of the time it just knocks out the commander. It also goes without saying that any heat or saber round can punch through you anywhere. And against the weaker shells, you can't even reliably increase the hull armor by angling. The hull of this tank is almost like a semicircle from the front, so if you do angle, the side armor becomes weak. And most of the time anyway, even if you do angle, the lower plate is still penable regardless. There's nothing you can actively do to increase its protection, which is a bit of a shame. Due to the weak hull armor and slower reactive mobility, the M48 isn't as reliable as the 47. At close range, you would get much better use out of the previous vehicle. The M48 can still of course play there, but it objectively isn't as capable. As the turret armor is completely rounded too, if your turret is pointing away from an enemy by even a few degrees, it's a very easy shot for weaker guns. The mantlet is immune to almost all APHE though, as it has an extra block of armor behind the mantlet which will stop these shells even at very close range, but Heat and Sabo can still get through, so it's not really a massive plus. Due to these quite prominent drawbacks, the M48 is much less reliable when fighting at close range. At long range though, it's still fairly decent. It doesn't have any active advantages over the M47 here, but it's the most reliable spot you have. Again for this, I would use the Heat in tandem with the Rangefinder and try to stay hull down, or at least try to hide the lower plate. At a kilometre away or so, APHE will start to struggle with the turret, so it is in a better spot here. You do have an ammo rack at the back of the turret though, but if you only take 17 rounds, this rack is empty. So it can be a good call to head into battle with between 20 to 25 rounds. By the time you start taking hits, you should have the rack empty. And to be honest, that's all that can really be said for this thing. It's still a standard MBT, capable of fighting anywhere, but it only really works reliably at long range. If you do find yourself at close range though, make sure you're not angling too much and keep your turret pointed towards your enemy. That's really the best you can do. Pros. Good firepower. 
decent mobility, and versatile. And the cons? Unreliable armor. For real this time. Verdict? I'd honestly consider this one. The armor is, in some ways, better, but it doesn't actively improve anything over the M47. If you have both the M47 and M48 in your lineup, there's no real reason to prioritize the M48 in any situation. It's worse at close range and pretty much the same at long range. The turret armor of the M48 is kind of more reliable at long range, but the M47 does have a smaller turret, which is harder to hit, so it's still scraping the bottom of the barrel for tangible advantages here. It's also in a notably worse place than the German M48 as well, which I was really positive about back when we covered Germany. That M48 is slightly faster, has a lower BR, and also doesn't fight Germany, which is really strong at this tier and probably the nation that collectively poses the most threat to a vehicle like this. Personally, I would give this thing a very slight reload buff. The turret is much more spacious, so thematically it works, and the ammo is very close to the loader. This would at least give it an actual hard advantage over the M47. Maybe it could even get some add-on track armor draped over the hull front. Who knows? So next up, we have the M60, which honestly looks quite bare if you're familiar with the later modernizations of the tank, but we will get to those next time. The M60 is overall an improvement to the M48, but it doesn't quite improve on everything. Mobility is slightly worse. The M60 loses 60 horsepower in the engine, which does make it a bit slower to react, but it isn't any heavier, so the top speed is the same. Mobility is still workable, but it doesn't exactly excel. Armor is half and half. The hull is much better. If you're slightly angled at normal combat ranges, the only AP rounds that can get through the upper plate are the French 120 and the Object 268's APHE. Everything weaker than this is not getting through. The lower plate is also really strong, surprisingly. It's immune to all APHE and Sabo, which is great. Although, heat can still get through, but heat can get through basically anything in this BR anyway. The corners of the hull also aren't rounded, so you can angle slightly as well. The sides of the hull are very weak, so you don't want to angle too much, but doing this is more of a suggestion to the enemy fighting you. You want them to aim for the hull most of the time, as the turret is actually weaker than the M48. The mantlet doesn't have the spall shield, so weak APHE can get through. The M60 also has a more pronounced turret ring, which only offers around 110mm of armor. Any weak shell can get through this, and if they do, it'll usually lead to a one-shot as three of the four crew are still in the turret. The cupola of this one actually does set off APHE fuses as well. I'm not sure if there's some mechanic that isn't quite working here, or whether it's just a byproduct of something else, but let's quickly take a look at it. Despite offering very similar thickness, if the M60 gets hit with APHE in the middle of the cupola, it will almost always set off the fuse. Whereas, if the same thing happens to the M48, it almost always doesn't set off the fuse. The same effect happens with almost every APHE round. I used to think this was because of the M60 Scopola being slightly larger, but that doesn't seem to really be the case, as rounds that have a very low fuse delay will still always detonate in the M60 and not in the M48. If the rounds hit the side of the M60 Scopola, it sometimes will just overpen, but most of the time you will be losing your turret. It's still kind of inconsistent for both vehicles, so I'm not completely sure what's happening. It does feel like there's some artificial buff in place that isn't quite working properly, Although this could also be the M48 Capola simulating the hatch at the back blowing out. The back of the Capola does have a hatch here, so maybe it's that. Either way, whatever is happening works to the M60's detriment. This does mean, however, that the M60 is potentially vulnerable to everything despite the good hull armor, which does add some negatives wherever you play potentially. But this thing does have a very good gun, an American version of the 105 L7 which is very common at this BR and greatly effective. It also reloads faster than the previous 90mm as well. Stock, it's an entire second quicker, which is a nice plus. This thing can equip Sabo, Heat, and Hesh, which is a nice set of rounds that lets you combat anything really. Sabo is stock, and it's the round I most commonly use. It's very easy to aim, rarely struggles with any armor, and causes a good amount of spooling. The heat is pretty good too. The velocity is still high, and it can get through a max of 400mm, enough to negate pretty much all armor and set off ammo reliably. The Hesh on this cannon though is much weaker than on the Ontos, and isn't really worth taking much of. 
You can take a couple of shells though, as there are some scenarios where the Hesh can get you a kill over the other shells, but this kind of situation might only come up 1 in 20 games, so it's really up to you. There's no real objective answer to which shell you should main. The Sabo and Heat both have advantages and disadvantages in any given situation. On some close range maps, I will take the Heat, but I usually main the Sabo because, in most situations, it lets me fire faster essentially. Because the Sabo is easier to aim accurately, you can snapshot with it quicker, which in turn will keep you alive longer. It's not a huge advantage overall, but from personal experience, I do find it more reliable. The Heat still definitely works though, so it's not a black and white choice. It's also much better at getting through Russian heavies from the front. As for playstyle, again, not much changes. I much prefer it to the M48, but it's still a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none kind of vehicle. It can do anything, but it doesn't really excel anywhere. Mobility isn't effective enough to reliably push to good areas of the map, and its armor in any situation isn't good enough to reliably trade shots with. It's a vehicle that lacks direction, I guess. It's kind of a stupid thing to say, but hopefully you know what I mean. If a tank has a completely reliable advantage, it's much easier to devise a playstyle for it. If you're playing something that will one-shot anything you hit, like the Sturmpanzer, you know that all you need to do is get into a position where you can easily click on someone. If you're in a vehicle with good mobility, you can pick a route to push down using that mobility and take enemies by surprise. With the M60 and vehicles like it, there's no advantage that you can really base a playstyle around. You do have your firepower, but your other assets can't always back it up. For a vehicle like this, the only thing that matters is where you put it. A good spot can make a mediocre vehicle perform well. You still have a rangefinder, and playing defensively at long range will still be workable. If you do want to play here, similarly to the M48, there is ammo in the turret. If you only have 17 rounds, the turret is again completely clear of ammo, so around 20 or so shells can keep you safe when hull down. You'll almost be impossible to one-shot like this with Sabo or Heat. You can also still brawl with it, or at least play at closer ranges. With your gun, you can click on enemies very quickly and usually disable them. You can bait shots with your angled front plate, and tanks with APHE will still have to aim for weak spots. This is where I usually play it, also for the reason that you actually kind of want enemies to aim for your hull. The turret can't really protect against anything, so giving enemies the option of hitting your hull gives them more opportunities to bounce. One final thing to keep in mind with close quarters fights is that your engine deck gives you a bit of a wide dead zone. I don't actually think it's intentional. You can't depress your gun over a large area of the engine deck even though there's no visible obstruction. Maybe there's another reason for this, but from looking at it on the surface, it doesn't quite seem right. Pros. Great firepower. Decent mobility. And versatile. Now the cons. Unreliable armor. And constant weak spots. Verdict. I think this might be the most torn I've been on a verdict for a while. I think in fairness, I will still have to go with a considerate. There is a lineup at 7-7, but the lineup at 8 is way more fleshed out and contains an objectively better version of the M60, so it's not really going to last long. The M60 is also folded behind the M48, so it's optional if you want to unlock and play it. If at the end of this video you think 7-7 could be fun, then I would pick up the M60 for sure, but if this tier doesn't seem that interesting in general, it might be worth skipping. Also, sorry for not giving any great advice for this one as well. A lot of making a vehicle like this work is mostly just general game knowledge. And I don't want to be patronizing and explain stuff you're probably well aware of already just to fit the theme. Next up, we have our final set of heavy tanks and we're starting with the T-32, which is like a sleeker and more advanced T-26 E5. These advancements bump it up quite heavily in BR though to 7.3, which does present some challenges for this vehicle. In general though, it's similar to the Jumbo in the sense that it's like a medium tank with heavy tank advantages. This thing is adequately responsive. It only has a max speed of 35 kph, but it can reach this speed quite easily off-road when spaded. Its initial acceleration and hull traverse is a little slow though, but if you start moving forwards or backwards before you turn, it does speed this up. You should do this for every tank though if you need to angle quickly. It can also hit 13 in reverse too, so it is capable enough, and you don't really need much additional speed due to a drawback we'll cover in a bit. Armor though is the most important factor for a tank like this, and it's pretty good, or maybe selectively good, would be a better way of putting it. Regarding standard AP and APHE, 
If you aren't at point blank range, the only guns that can get through your upper hull are the French 120, German 128, and the 152 on the Object 268. All other weaker shells can't get through without aiming for weak spots, but unfortunately, there are several. Any contemporary APHE shell can get through the corners of the lower plate and the machine gun port. If you angle, the lower plate weak spot is mitigated slightly, but you can't completely nullify it. The side armor of this thing is still decently strong, so you can comfortably angle to throw off certain weaker shells. The turret, though, is much more reliable. At standard ranges, barely any AP-type rounds can actually get through. The turret face offers 280mm of base protection, with an internal spore liner as well. So at around 500 meters, the only round that can technically get through the turret face in the BR range is the 130 on the IS-7. You're rarely going to see this, so if you're hull down at range, it's only going to be Sabo and Heat getting through you. And even then, you can soak up these rounds from time to time. At around 800 meters, 105 Sabo can't get through the turret. Even Heat can fail to penetrate on the sides of the turret face and the corners of the mantlet. So in the right spot, the T-32 can be invulnerable to the majority of vehicles it can potentially meet. This is a great advantage, but not one that can work on every map. Which is a shame, as out of cover, this thing is much less reliable. A lot of the armor you have is good though, so it can work at close range and will bounce shots being aggressive, but it's really the firepower that ends up holding it back here. Performance-wise, this thing uses a functionally identical cannon to the Super Pershing, the Long 90. But as the T-32 uses two-piece ammunition, the reload is even longer at 18.8 seconds stock. This reload makes sense from a historical perspective. Two-piece ammunition takes longer to load, the turret is quite cramped, and the charges and warheads are far apart. But from the perspective of the gun effectively being a tool in a video game, it doesn't really justify the drawback of the reload. In a game sense, a long reload balances a powerful gun. If you have to wait 20 seconds to fire, you'd expect anything you hit to go down in one shot, or at least be severely crippled. The Object 268 reloads in 22.3 seconds. Anything you hit is likely out in one shot. The Sturer and Mills reload is 19.4 seconds, same thing. Reload is a trade-off for killing power if you strip down the mechanics, but it isn't really justified here. If we look at analog guns with similar performance across different nations, the T-32 really sticks out. Again, let's put the historical aspect to one side and just look at it from a gameplay perspective. Germany has the Long 88, 9.7 seconds on the Tiger II. Russia has the 100, 11.1 seconds on the T-54. Japan has the 105 on the Ho Ri, 11.1 seconds again, and Britain has 8.1 seconds on the 20 pounder. These guns are of course all different, but you could group them together in a kind of weight class for the gun. They're all around the same caliber and offer a very similar amount of penetration and reliability. And the reload of the T-32 is at least a third longer than all of them, almost twice as long as the 20 pounder and 88. The T-32's gun is good, performance-wise, but it doesn't even top the list of these guns. It even has the lowest amount of penetration power. I'm not saying it needs the extra pen, but from a purely gameplay perspective, its reload doesn't justify its performance, especially as well if you lose your loader. I don't think it needs to share the same reload of these guns, but even bringing it down by a quarter would really increase its ability to fight outside of its perfect combat environment. If its armor was as reliable as it was back when the US tank tree came out, the reload would still be bad, but you could at least rely on the armor. In 2022, this is not the case, with the amount of heat and ATGMs present at the same BR as the T-32. You could argue that you're even hindering yourself by playing it. If you played the M47 instead, you'd have a vehicle that's faster, has access to a heat round, and has half the reload. All the T-32 has is the armor, and if you can't use that as an advantage, what's the point in limiting yourself when you could play another vehicle at the same BR with more reliable attributes? Despite the reload being a drawback, the T-32 is still a functional tank, but going into it with the expectation of it being a traditional heavy tank won't lead to consistently good games. This tank works best at mid-range. At long range, your armor is going to be great if hull down, but the gun might let you down here. At close range, enemies can rush you easily while you're on reload, and as you have a huge muzzle break, most enemies that can identify you as a T-32 will aim for it as a default every time. Not to mention at close range, your weak spots are much easier to hit. 
A mid-range hull-down location is where this thing gets the best of both worlds. If you can find a sightline that you can watch that lets you hide your hull, this is where you should put yourself. If this sort of spot doesn't exist, you can still play this tank like any other, rolling from cover to cover and clicking on enemies. But you will in effect be at the mercy of your opponents while doing this, especially in the higher BRs. Mobility-wise, this thing can be okay on most terrain. It holds its max speed well and doesn't really need much more speed, even though a statement like that might seem stupid on the surface. Because of the slow reload, you can't reliably use the mobility aggressively. By playing at close range, almost every enemy will outpace your reload by double in some cases, so even if you are rolling from cover to cover, never be too aggressive. The tank can't back it up. It's important to mention though that this tank will still catch badly placed shots from a lot of common enemies. It catches shots that the M47 and M48 for example can't, so you might find that you see more success with the T32 on that basis even though its potential is lower. If played perfectly, the M47 will do much better than the T32, but playing perfectly in an asymmetrical game like War Thunder isn't really possible, even for the best players in the world. So the armor does still have value here. In 7-3 matches, in the right situation, it can still be a monster. You will see BMPs, Leopards, and Object 120s at this BR, but there will also be a lot of vehicles that can barely scratch you if you keep that lower plate hidden. It's also notably effective against auto cannon tanks, especially the PT-7657. The T-32 is one of the only vehicles at this BR that's immune to it frontally. It can get through the machine gun port, but not if you angle. So it does have some value here, even if it's not consistent. Like the Pershing, make sure to keep angled and move backwards or forwards if you're being aimed at. And if you're at close range, wiggle the turret around too. A lot of enemies will go for your barrel, and if they miss, they're not getting through your turret. For general safety, try and place yourself at a distance from the location enemies could appear from. If you fire at them and miss, you need to make sure that you're far enough away so that they can't catch you on reload. Keeping a fair distance with this thing really is key, as this helps you mitigate your weak spots and reload, which are your two biggest disadvantages. Pros. Good firepower. Decent mobility. Good hull down protection. And versatile. And the cons. Long reload. And prominent weak spots. Verdict. It was close, but I would still get this one. It kind of lives and dies on a dice roll, but it does simultaneously offer advantages the other tanks you have at this BR don't have. To get it into its element, it is very map dependent, but you do have a 7-3 lineup, so if you're on a map where the M47 works better, you can take it. And if you're on a map with good hull down positions or your top tier, the T32 still can shine. I do still think it needs a reload buff, but either way, pick it up. Just keep in mind that it probably won't be the spearhead of your lineup. But 7-3 is fun, and this thing does have a place, even if that place is somewhat niche. Next up, we have an advancement, the T32E1, which has much more reliable armor when directly compared to the regular T32, but this armor is kind of its downfall. Mobility and firepower are completely identical. The E1 is the same weight as the regular version and doesn't get any new rounds. The turret armor is identical too, but it's the hull that's completely different. The lower plate and machine gun port weak spots have been completely removed. The upper plate is also at a steeper angle, so it's slightly stronger as well. Not by too much, but it's now immune to the German 128, and if you angle, you can almost become immune from L7 Sabo although this is only really reliable at mid to long range. Within a few hundred meters, it will still get through. So, great, right? Well, at 7-7, seven, seven, not consistently. This thing is sort of an example of why balancing heavy tanks with no frontal weak spots is almost impossible. Balancing vehicles in this game is less about the vehicle itself and more so the effect it has on vehicles that have to fight it. If played well against a team of mostly 6-3s or 6-7s, a tank like this can be devastating. In this setting, entire lineups of tanks are unable to penetrate it. It would be entirely dishonest to pretend this would consistently happen, but the possibility is there, and if it does happen, it can ruin the game for several players who have no way to counter it, apart from hit the barrel. And loosely, I believe this is why it's at 7-7, despite this battle rating crippling the reliability of the vehicle. 
Mobility is workable and the gun is workable, but this thing is where it is because of the armor. The armor is absolutely its defining trait and is the primary factor putting it at this BR. And to put this into perspective, bear in mind I probably missed a few vehicles, so give or take a few percent, but counting every currently available tank that isn't an SPA within the 7-7 spread, 6-7 to 8-7, around 82% of the vehicles you can potentially fight have a round that can completely negate this thing's armor. So let's just say 4 out of 5. Of course, you will still fight vehicles below this BR that can't touch you. You can easily fight a vehicle that's stock or isn't loading the shell but can damage you, but the point is that it's not reliable. And if the armor isn't reliable, there's little point taking it out. Even if you angle perfectly, it's not always going to help. This thing, more commonly than the regular T-32, will fight strong MBTs like the Type 74, Leopard A1A1, the Chieftain, all the while having a reload that's almost twice as long as all of these vehicles that actively outclass you in every way. The E1 is still fighting to the strengths of old technology in an advanced meta it doesn't quite belong in. And if it stays at 7-7, it will just keep getting worse as there's little chance now that a vehicle will be added within this BR range that can't punch right through it. So that ratio we mentioned before will just keep going up. It's still more than possible for all the pieces to fall into place while using this thing. The gun one-shots a lot, the mobility lets you roll around, and you will still bounce shells, even strong ones from time to time, but it really is like rolling a dice. Imagine a game where you have a six-sided die and you lose every time it doesn't land on one, and have to pay the dealer five dollars. Why would you even play that game? It would suck. It's a lazy analogy, as it's not like you'll lose by default just because you can fight tanks that can point and click on you, but you have more reliable options at this BR, you have more games to play. There are other tanks at this battle rating that have more reliable advantages you can actually lean on and play into. You can't really lean on the E1 to do anything for you here. This thing's best spot is still a hull down really, at least in terms of reliable protection, which is identical to the previous T32 at 7.3. The hull does offer an advantage, and I've definitely been in situations where being in the E1 let me push enemies I couldn't have pushed otherwise, but it won't always be like that. Regardless, like the previous T32, you might still find yourself doing well in this thing because it will catch poorly placed rounds. I don't want to try and present this tank as unusable. If you know what you're doing, you can still come out positive using it, and if you have a lineup at 7-7, you can just choose to play it in down tiers and ignore it the rest of the time but there's still another 7-7 heavy tank to go. Regardless for playstyle, not a lot changes. You should still look for hull down locations and keep angled and on the move if you're being engaged. And also, know which enemies you can reliably push. King Tigers frontally, for example, are no threat to you at all. Same with the Maus and late IS series. Its playstyle is still old school and simple. Just cross your fingers and hope that you don't run into a fully stabilized MBT. Pros. Decent firepower, decent mobility, good hull down protection, and versatile. And the cons? Long reload, unreliable armor, and suffers an up tiers. Verdict? I might have to sadly say, avoid it. If you're a player that's confident with maps and the enemies you'll fight, you will still make this tank work. I'm sure a lot of people still have fond memories of this thing back in 2018 when it was 7-0 and fought a larger ratio of tanks that couldn't scratch it. But in 2022, it doesn't hold the same level of reliability. And as it's folded and doesn't really have a place in the 8.0 lineup, there's little reason to take it out and spade it right now. Next up, our final heavy tank for the USA, the M103. When American Ground Forces came out, this was the endline tank actually. I remember being quite excited for it at the time because it just looked a bit weird. I remember thinking that the turret looked like an eggplant from the side. Anyway, the M103 is a big change in design from the T32, and that change does reflect in its playstyle. It's considerably different. Mobility is slightly worse. The 103 has an 810 horsepower engine, but is several tons heavier so it has a slightly lower top speed and acceleration. It can also only hit 8 in reverse, but its neutral steering speed is considerably faster, and in any case, it doesn't really need to use the mobility aggressively very much, so it's not a huge drawback. Armor as well is pretty good. The hull front looks similar to the M48, but it's much thicker. It's almost immune to APHE. 
The only shell that can get through it reliably is the French 120. The turret is similarly almost immune as well, with these shells only being able to get through the turret neck and the very corners of the lower cheeks, which does make it pretty reliable. 105 Sabo can only get through the turret on these lower cheeks as well, with 105 Heat not being able to get through the mantlet. Even APF SDS rounds of this BR can't get through the mantlet, so turret protection is really good. If you can use this thing's 8 degrees of gun depression to hide the bottom part of the turret, it's honestly quite reliable. Definitely check out the armor in the hangar yourself though, as the layout is quite segmented and a bit complicated, and you can probably get a better idea looking it over yourself at your own pace. But generally, it is workable. The gun though is what rounds this tank off. It comes with the 120mm M58 cannon with two main rounds. An APBC shell with just over 300mm of point blank pen, which has similar flat pens to the 120 on the T34, but it's much more reliable at range and against angles. It also has a higher velocity too. It does have a pretty odd property though that we'll cover in a second. The second round is a heat FS shell that can get through 380mm with a lot of explosive power. I find it one shots less reliably than the AP, so it's usually my secondary round, but it can get through almost any armor and will cause a lot of damage. I just personally find it less reliable. When you're using high caliber guns, you want to use the shell that will one shot as to not use two reload cycles on one enemy. Speaking of the reload as well, it's only 0.6 seconds slower than the T32 at 19.4 seconds stock, which kind of puts it into perspective. This gun is very reliable, but the APBC does have a strange relationship with sloped armor. The ricochet chance for this round is very high on angles. Just to put it into perspective, on screen now is a series of shots I took at the Panther in the test drive at only a few hundred meters away. At this angle, the Panther's hull only offers around 160mm of protection from this shell, but because of its ricochet chance, I bounced three times in a row. I don't know why the bounce chance is so high for a round this powerful. To me, it doesn't make much sense on the surface, but I don't know too much about this sort of thing from a real-world perspective. Most of the time, the round will cut right through armor with no issue, but just keep in mind that you might get some bounces that seem weird on T-54s and similar vehicles from time to time. It does feel a bit random, but nevertheless, most vehicles you won't struggle with. As for using it, hull down at range is where it works best. The turret armor is much more reliable, your gun works great at distance, and the rangefinder helps out even further. The 103 does have ammo in the turret, but if you take only 14 rounds, the turret is completely clear. At long range, you're almost immune from APHE and nearly Sabo as well. Heat can still get through, but as this thing has four crew spread out in the turret, one-shotting it is very hard. So if you have a spot like this, take it. If you are playing at the closer ranges, keep an eye on where your turret is pointing. It's huge and somewhat rounded, so if you're turning your turret to aim at an enemy, make sure you're not presenting the side of it to someone else. It's a very easy pen and easy to do by mistake. With a vehicle like this, you get no advantage by playing at close range. At distance, your armor is more reliable and your gun is still reliable. By playing here, there's no advantage you miss apart from potentially seeing fewer enemies. And then the argument becomes, why not play a vehicle that's more reliable at close range that can see more enemies? It's a valid point and one that I think is worth bringing up. It's true that the M103 is hardly meta because of the reload and mobility, but it's more reliable in its peak environment than, say, the M60 is. You won't be topping the board, but you'll likely stay alive for a long time and pick up some kills. You can, though, also play it outside of cover too. I don't want to pigeonhole the vehicle too much. If the match calls for it, you can leave cover and go on the offensive. You are more vulnerable here, but you can still do it. Unlike the T32, you can lean on your firepower. This 120 is really powerful. You will one-shot most tanks with a center mass hit without even thinking most of the time. It's usually point and click. It generates a lot of spool and there's very few enemies that you'll struggle with in general. A lot of tanks of this BR are quite squishy. So even in full up tiers, you can still rely on the gun. You will need to be passive and snipe to do well in this environment, sure, but the firepower will carry you wherever you choose to play it. Pros, great firepower, good hold down protection, and versatile. And the cons, long reload, and unreliable armor when out of cover. Verdict, I would get it, 
You'll always have an advantage in up tiers, and with good positioning, you can make this thing work most of the time. In some situations, and on some maps, it won't have a lot of use, but in a good lineup, it will still have a place. You can even use it in 8.0 for a while. It is still a lineup vehicle in most scenarios, but it lets you play reliably in ways that you couldn't otherwise, so I would still give it a go. Next up, something completely different. This is the M163, our only SPA this tier, and one that's wildly different to the previous vehicles. This thing is on the chassis of the M113, and comes with a single but powerful cannon, the 20mm VADS Vulcan Air Defense System, with a fire rate of 3000 rounds per minute, which is insane really. A tiny burst impacting a plane is enough to take it down, but getting the lead right can be quite tedious. It's one of the hardest radar SPAA to use consistently, and if you haven't used it for a while like me, it will take some time to get used to the lead. The 163 does have a radar, but it's unfortunately only a tracking radar so it doesn't search and find targets for you. It can also only lock onto enemies in a very narrow cone, so sometimes you'll have to spam your radar lock key to actually get the tracker to activate. It's also very sensitive to clutter, so if you're around any vertical objects, they can disrupt the lock. They don't even need to break up your line of sight. Even when you have a lock though, aiming is still difficult. Even though the VADS fires so quickly, it's only a single gun at a comparatively low caliber, and doesn't have the wide and forgiving dispersion found on the dual mounts most other 8.0 AAs have, which means you have to be quite careful about engaging. One of the most important aspects to this thing is only firing at an enemy when it's as close to you as possible. Even if you have the lock on an aircraft a few miles away, you will still need some adjustment to land a burst. And because this thing is so noticeable, once it fires, any enemy in the air won't give you an easy shot after it becomes aware of you it's very hard for this thing to land an accurate burst on a manoeuvring enemy. I'd say it's probably the worst radar AA at doing this, so to get kills, you need an easy target most of the time. The 163 is the most usable when it has the element of surprise. If you can see that an aircraft is on a dive run, wait until the last second to start blasting. You only need a few shots on an enemy to take it down, so you really need to make those shots count basically. Despite it not really being an incredible advantage, all things considered, the 163 is also probably the hardest radar AA to identify from the air. It's small, doesn't have a spinning dish drawing the eye, and doesn't look like a normal anti-air, so most enemies won't pick it out easily. One sort of incidental drawback to this thing specifically is actually your teammates in radar AA. Out of the examples from 8.0 to 8.3, the 163 is one of the least usable, and if you're competing with a few teammates for air kills, you'll rarely be the one scoring them. Most other AA in this bracket have a search radar too, so they can spot enemies before you. Also, most players using radar AA do like to fire way before they should, especially if they're competing for air kills with other AA. This will usually spook enemy air and cause them to be much more cautious, which is a really bad situation for this vehicle and can make using it a bit frustrating. It's also not incredibly reliable in the anti-tank role either. It can strip off barrels and tracks very quickly, but you have no armor and most of the time an enemy will just click on you before you get to disable them. This thing can only get through a max of 53mm at point blank, which drops off fairly quickly. So you can only reliably take out light vehicles, and even then you need a good angle on most of them in order to disable them quickly. But the mobility is good, so you could potentially luck your way through a flank as a first spawn but this is rarely successful in my experience. You also have a pair of light vehicles at AO that can fill this sort of role anyway, which we'll cover next time. The best you can do with this vehicle is to just sit by some cover, make yourself harder to spot, and when you see an enemy aircraft approaching, fire at the last second. And if you're thinking of spawning this thing, take a look at the team list first. If there are already a couple of friendly anti-airs, you likely won't contribute much. Pros, decent anti-air ability, and good mobility. And the cons, poor survivability, no search radar, and difficult to aim. Verdict? Despite it being close to the bottom of the barrel, I would still get it, just for the reason that it's better at combating fast aircraft than the other options you have available. I don't think it's worth spading, mostly because coming up after this one in rank 6 is one of the best radar anti-airs so I'd just pick this one up close to the end of your tier 5 grind, and use it until you unlock the next one. 
So next up, we have a very unique vehicle. This is the T95, one of the few super heavy tanks in the game. We briefly looked at the T28 in the last episode, which is basically this thing, but without the extra tracks and side armor. The T95 has four individual tracks. It's one of only a couple of vehicles in the entire game to have this setup. Sadly though, if you lose just one track, you can't keep driving. You'll be stuck just like everyone else. This tank is also tied for the slowest vehicle in the entire game at a max of 12 kph and a reverse of 4. This thing weighs 86 tons and only has a 500 horsepower engine. That's the same amount of horsepower the Pershing has, so speed is absolutely a limiting factor. But because of the four tracks, traverse rate is actually pretty quick. Once spaded and on a good crew, you can swing the hull around relatively quickly, which is really the most you could hope for for a vehicle like this. Firepower is honestly really good. This thing comes with the 105T5E1 cannon, which is found on the T28, and a functionally identical version being found on the T29. At 20 seconds stock, the reload is slow, but it does come with a fantastic APHE round. 177 grams of explosive filler and just over 250 millimeters of penetration. This gun will rarely struggle with anything apart from the odd mouse, but generally, very capable gun with excellent one-shot potential. Armor is the most decisive element of this tank though. Frontally, this thing has 305 millimeters of armor. It's cast though, so it does have a lower modifier and this brings the actual functional thickness to 287, which is still incredible. This thing is immune to every AP and APHE shell in the BR range, apart from the French 120, but it does need to be very close to get through. On a bad angle from the front, even some early heat will fail to penetrate. And segueing actually onto the side armor, the main drawback of the T28 was the side, only 50 millimeters thick, which severely limited what it could actually do. This thing though has no such problem, actually having a very effective amount of side armor, relatively speaking. Not to the point where the side armor factors into the playstyle in any way, but it can actually save you. The middle part of the side armor is triple stacked, having just under 200 millimeters of effective thickness. The lower side armor is about the same as well. Although, because of all the space in between the first plate, tracks, and the actual side of the hull, APHE will fuse before actually penetrating the crew compartment, so this section of the armor is pretty much immune to APHE. These factors generally don't come into gameplay much, but it's still an advantage to know of in any case. The T95 has one major weakness though, and it's not actually the Capolas. These are still weak points, but they function differently to regular Capolas, like the M48. These were changed a few years ago so that they no longer fuse any APHE shells. Around hitting them will just spool some shrapnel into the crew and overpen. These rounds will no longer one-shot the tank, which is really nice. AP will usually knock out a couple of crew members though as it generates much more spooling, and additionally Hesh and High Caliber HE will cripple this thing if it hits the roof. But the main drawback is the muzzle brake. It's very big and easy to hit, and because the T95 is so unique and well known, at this point almost everyone has just learned to shoot for the gun and then flank, which kind of negates the armor a bit and can make this thing tedious to play. In terms of actually playing it, it's not too complicated as the mobility severely limits what you can actually do. So in effect, you almost can't do anything wrong in the T95. It's a very reactive vehicle, ironically, in the sense that things will usually happen to you first and you react to that. But you can get away with being quite aggressive if you're careful, spade the vehicle and have a decent driver. Long range is quite a sensible spot for this thing. The weak points are much harder to hit, and if you're not up-tiered, you'll almost be immune from 95% of the vehicles you'll fight. Another benefit of a long-range spot is that you likely won't have to travel very far to get there. What I usually try to do is just park at the end of the first sightline I come across. Doing this is quick, and you'll earn lots of points by bouncing shots and form a good distraction for the rest of your team. Usually a couple of enemies will get so hooked on shooting you, they won't push up so you can be passively useful like that. In the right situation, this thing can entirely lock down a sightline, although it's also a bomb magnet. If any aircraft is up, they will go for you constantly. You're big and too slow to drive off. And so if you knock out an enemy and they can come back in a plane, they'll know exactly where you are and beeline right for you. If you are watching a sightline at long range and generally being annoying, which this thing can be, the majority of the enemy team will be aware of you, which brings up this likelihood even further. 
This aspect ties into another issue as well, which is the repair cost at 18.8k. From my perspective, it's this high because in the right situation, the T95 is almost unkillable and can really disrupt the enemy team. But that's never going to always be the case, which can add some frustration to playing it. You have no ability to dodge a bomb and you'll get punished quite severely if you do get bombed, which probably does seem a bit unfair. So take the repair cost as another soft con to the vehicle in general. The main downside though is heat. At 7.3 and above, all it takes is one enemy with heat to negate this thing entirely. And at long range, you're very vulnerable to this. Of course, you're still vulnerable at close range as well, but if a round can get through you easily at long range, it sort of defeats the point of being there. So check the BR and who you're fighting before you spawn. If you're fighting Russia, France, China or the UK, you'll be pretty safe at range. But Germany, Italy, Japan and Sweden can be a lot more dangerous, so always check this before spawning. This is a generalization and won't always be consistently reliable, but it is a good baseline. And in any case, you'll still see a lot of tanks that can't scratch you. If you're up tiered, enemies on the other team are too. For me though, this thing is the most fun at closer ranges. I say fun and not functional though, as the T95 is very much a dice roll vehicle. Its success in matches is decided on factors outside of your control. You might run head on into 10 tanks that can't pen you, or you may run into 4 BMPs. It can never be entirely reliable. But at close range, you really can panic people. Generally, I like to just hold W until I reach a cap or form a sort of mobile front line for the team. This thing does attract a lot of attention, so sticking with your teammates can be a mutual benefit. Although, as we mentioned, your barrel is the main weakness here. You can't entirely get around this, but you can make it harder to hit. If an enemy is aiming for you, swing the hull from side to side. Because of the four tracks, your traverse rate is really quick, so you can do this very rapidly. Just throw your barrel around and try and make your enemy miss. The other advantage you have is the roof mounted 50 cal. What I see a lot of enemies try is shoot my barrel, then my track, and try to drive on my sides. But with the 50, you can track them in turn. This is vital for playing at close range. So make sure you have a hotkey set up to directly select your machine gun, as this really will save you. Sorry if there's not really definitive advice for this one in terms of positioning, but honestly it just boils down to hold W and see what happens. Maybe you'll get lucky. Pros, great firepower, and of course great armor, most of the time. And the cons, long reload, terrible mobility, prominent weak spots, and suffers an up tiers. Verdict. I would consider it. I really like this vehicle personally, but it isn't for everyone and becomes redundant very quickly. If you're not interested in staying at this BR for long, it won't have much use for you. But if you want to play it for a while, it can be really fun in the right situation, but it requires a different mindset, I guess. This thing plays like no other vehicle in the game, so you might need to be in a specific mood to get the most out of it. As getting taken out is rarely your fault, the vehicle is so limited, so there's little you can actually do wrong. And maybe for some of you that is an appealing aspect. If you play a strong meta tank like the M47 and get taken out, you might beat yourself up about it. But if you get taken out in this thing, it's like, well, yeah, of course that was going to happen. There's not really any expectation for the T95. I appreciate that's a bit of a weird thing to talk about, but if you want a bit of a break sometimes, this thing can be pretty good. But whether it's pretty good for you, I can't really say. So, first for our premiums is one that soon, unfortunately, at time of recording, will become unavailable. This is the Magak 3, an Israeli modified M48 that's functionally a bit of a hybrid between the M48 and M60. Think of it basically as an M48 hull, M60 turret, and M60 engine. It's a bit more technical than that, but that's the gist. The Magak features a lot of extra improvements as well. It comes with multiple smoke grenade launches and a stereoscopic rangefinder, which despite having the same visual icon, functions differently than the normal one. This version can range out to a max of 4,000 meters on a good crew and acquires the range much faster. The cupola on the Magak is much smaller too, but it does lose the 50 cal, which can put you at a slight disadvantage against light vehicles. It's also, as you can see, covered in ERA, explosive reactive armor. 
The Magak uses the Blazer type, which adds 260mm of protection against chemical shells. From the front, these bricks can block 105 heat if they hit the upper hull and parts of the turret, but they will still break through the lower plate and turret sides. Either way though, it does add decent protection, even though the Magak unfortunately combines the unreliable hull of the M48 with the unreliable turret of the M60. It's still very much a master of none kind of tank, but it's pretty good at range thanks to the ERA and the rangefinder. Is it the best premium this tier? I don't think so. It's got a good lineup and adds something over the tech tree analogs, but it doesn't really let you do anything new, and for a vehicle you have to pay to use, you'll want something a little more than that. For 50 euros, I wouldn't say it's a bad idea to buy it, as it's not unusable, but it still hardly stands out. Although, if you like the very general playstyle this thing offers, it might fit for you. By the time that Israeli Ground Forces comes out, which is planned for the next update, this tank will be removed from the store and eventually reinstated in the Israeli tree. And if it does follow this trend, it will likely never be sold in the US tree ever again. So if you are watching this close to the time of release, you won't get another chance of this one in the US tree. Although, don't feel pressured to buy it just on that basis. It's always a shame to miss out on something, but at the end of the day, it is just pixels. And there's still some more premiums to look at that aren't going anywhere. Next up is the T-54E1, which is quite a unique vehicle for the USA. This thing is on the hull of the M48 and has some quite interesting firepower. It comes with a unique and powerful 105mm gun, an oscillating turret, and a 5 second autoloader. And this thing really is all in the firepower. It comes with APBC, HeatFS, and the Sabo is the real standout here. It's more powerful than the L7 Sabo across the board, with much better angled penetration. On top of that, it causes a lot more spooling. The Sabo round on the L7 is only 4kg, this one is 6.2kg, so it has a lot more weight behind it and it one-shots very reliably, whether you're going for crew or ammo. It has 9 rounds in the autoloader, so effectively you have 10 shots before you need to wait and reload. Reloading the rounds into the autoloader can take some time though, so if you're having a very action-packed game, it can get a bit difficult. Firepower is really the only standout option on this one. It has the same hull and engine as the M48, but is 8 tons heavier, so it does feel a bit sluggish. The armor for AO isn't very impressive either. The turret can bounce in certain spots as it is very inconsistent, but overall, anything will have the potential to knock you out. The accuracy as well also gets pretty poor if you fire continuously, making fighting at range a bit annoying sometimes. The turret traverse is also quite low due to the heavier turret at 12.6 degrees a second. But overall, the firepower does manage to carry it. It's very easy to aim the gun and does a lot of damage when you hit. And if you don't hit, after a few seconds, you can try again. It has a rangefinder too. As we mentioned a few times already, AO has a pretty beefy lineup and this thing can work there but it does still lack contemporary technology like thermals and a stabilizer, so up tiers can still be challenging. I think it adds more over the Magak in terms of new things it can do, but it is quite vulnerable in up tiers if you aren't in a strong spot. So it does have notable pros and cons. It's also fairly expensive at 8560 GE, which is technically cheaper than the Magak, especially if you get it on a discount, so it's not a bad vehicle. It definitely does have a lot of potential. If you think you have a good enough grasp of the game to counter this thing's drawbacks, it will net you a lot of RP and lions. But if you're still a bit new and maybe not quite as confident, you will commonly be fighting vehicles that have a lot of advantages over you, so I would only pick this thing up if you're really sure about it. Also, try and wait for a sale if you can. It cuts out a big chunk of the price. Finally today, quite a cute tank, the T114, which is a pretty interesting light tank. This thing comes with the same gun that's found on the Ontos, but it doesn't get the Hess shell, which is not too much of a shame these days. It's also partially auto-loaded. It doesn't have a traditional mechanized ammo rack, but it has a first stage of three rounds with a very fast reload. 2.6 seconds on a decent crew, giving you four shots before you have to reload the rack. You can still fire after the rack is depleted, but your reload will be around four times longer. In any case, the rack does refill quite quickly, so overall it is a nice setup. The vehicle is also very mobile forwards and backwards, and is more survivable than most similar vehicles. It's still very weak, it barely has any armour, 
but it can't overpressure like other light tanks. It can also bounce rounds off the upper hull sometimes too. Its protection is obviously not reliable, but it is better than similar vehicles, which is worth something. The T114 is quite a forgiving vehicle actively. Passively, not so much, but if you make a misplay down to your own actions, it's not very punishing. You can fire the gun rapidly if you miss your first shot, and you can move around quickly if you get spotted and need to relocate. The turret can traverse a full 360, which is much better than the Ontos, but it's only able to elevate the gun 8 degrees, so it can't always aim up enough if you're on a downwards incline. That's really the only tedious aspect to it though. This thing is basically up tier proof, so you can put it in various different lineups and it will still work there. You will need to be a bit more careful with it in up tiers though, as thermals and stabilizers do cut into its reliability a bit. Out in the open, or if caught on the move, this thing is dead. The gun is very bouncy, so it is slow to react, especially as an enemy doesn't really need to aim for very long to knock you out in one shot. But due to its small size and good mobility, you can play it very similarly to the Ontos with good success. It's great in ambush and on the flanks, and still has the firepower to take out anything. The four rounds are enough to guarantee a kill in any situation, really. So if you're not very confident, this thing does throw you a lot of second chances as long as you see an enemy first. The T114 can be pretty fun. It's also kind of gross if you have the old six-piece bush setup. At 8,020 GE, it can be a nice tank to play around with, although I would still try to wait for a sale. Personally, I do prefer it to the T54. If you can get it into a good spot at any BR, it's pretty consistent even against stronger enemies, and it does work nicely in different lineups too, although if you prefer tanks with at least a bit of armour, the T-54 is still good. I like both of these as vehicles, although the T-114 does have a slightly lower reward multiplier than the T-54. And also, just for the end here, for a bit of perspective, the next tier has one of the most effective premiums in the entire game, and is able to research rank 6 as well. So if you're not completely sold on these two, which is fair as they're not utterly outstanding premiums, rank 6 might have what you're looking for. So next up are our planes, and as this tier for lineups is basically just 7-0 to 7-7, there's only a couple to look at. Nevertheless though, we're starting with the F3D1. This is a slightly chubby naval jet that's decently equipped for the environment. Its best loadout is okay. It can carry a max of two 2,000 pound bombs that unfortunately do drop together but it is enough for a double kill most of the time if you get lucky. It does also come with a set of smaller bombs too if you're low on spawn points, so you can commonly take it out. The aircraft also comes with four 20mm cannons, which are great at knocking out aircraft and tanks as well. They're also very easy to aim as they're placed in the nose. A lot of tanks were nerfed last update with their engine decks becoming much weaker. These guns shred the engines on anything really. Its flight performance as a fighter is decent too, it can turn fight with some of the heavier aircraft and will outpace most contemporary props, and it's also one of the cheapest aircraft to repair this tier, so you won't be breaking the bank by taking it out. Next up, we have the A2D1. This is a pretty expensive premium for what it is at 6,900 GE, but it is still very effective, so I did want to talk about it. This thing is a very heavy and powerful turboprop able to carry a huge load of ordnance. The A2D has a few standout options, two 2,000 pound bombs and eight 500s which drop in pairs, two 2000s and 20 HVARs that fire separately if you want to splash AA in light vehicles, and if your aim is good enough, 20 250 pound bombs that still drop in pairs. You can even take it out clean wing. It's a decently capable fighter as long as you stay straight and manage your speed. Although for full price, I wouldn't recommend that you buy it just for cast alone. Only pick it up if you'll play it in air as well. This thing is a lot of money, and from my perspective, it's not worth paying that much for something you have no guarantee of being able to use. If you can't get enough spawn points to use it, it's just sitting there. Whereas, for that price, you can buy three talismans this tier for ground vehicles, all of which you can use consistently and whenever you like. If you get it on sale, it's very much worth it, but I wouldn't rush to buy this one if you are considering other options. And finally, we have the F-89B. I almost didn't include this one, but from giving it another thought, it's still really effective. This thing is a large twin-engine jet fighter with no suspended ordnance, but it has some incredible gun casts, 
six 20mm cannons with a total of 1,200 rounds, and a pen on the armor piercing belt of 53mm. Of course, you're never going to achieve that pen unless you're already plummeting into the ground, but at most ranges, you'll have around 35 to 40 millimeters of penetration, which is enough to shred anything on the ground. It rips through roofs, engines, can spray down anti-air, and destroys aircraft too. It's quite big and can get caught out on low speed, but with some careful flying, it can really be a monster. It is, however, 7,540 GE, so similarly to the A2D, I would wait for a sale if you do want to pick it up. In clear airspace, this thing has huge potential though. It's almost a bit like a baby A10. And in any case, it is pretty fun to use. So if you've got the budget, it's a solid pick for this BR. So there we are guys, that's everything for today. On screen now are the best lineups I think you can make using vehicles from this tier. I haven't included the VADs as the only lineup it works in is in the next tier and there's no real point up tiering your vehicles that rely on their advantages at their BR at the expense of an anti-air vehicle so I've left that one for now. Also, for aircraft, it's also not really a bad idea to just use the prop aircraft from the last tier. They still work fine and the repair cost isn't too high. There's only one mainline uh, aircraft that I included in this video because the repair cost on the others is just not really worth it most of the time. So using the earlier cheaper vehicles can also work, and because they are from a lower BR, they're cheaper to spawn too, which works quite nicely. Apart from that, I really hope you enjoyed it. Sorry it's a bit long again. I don't know if people enjoy these or not. In the past, I used to kind of limit myself when I made them to only include the most important points. But as I'm writing them now, I just keep thinking of other things that I think are important to keep in mind. Like if I'm playing the vehicle and it's something that I actively keep in mind while I'm playing it, I always include that now and that usually makes the videos a bit longer. Um, so hopefully it's not too much of a slog to get through. And also sorry it took a while, uh, it's, it took way longer than I thought. It's been quite a difficult um, stretch of time, I think. But we always get there in the end. And that will continue to happen. Next year is quite long, uh, there's a lot of vehicles and a lot that I want to get right. Um, so I will take my time with it. I'm thinking of trying to work on some shorter videos intermittently so there's not too much of a wait between the usual stuff, just so there's always something to listen to, I guess. I have some ideas, so we'll see what sticks, I guess. Anyway, it's currently Saturday right now, and I'm in the office doing this last stretch of voiceover. I tried to do it on Friday, um, but it was before me and Mike's stream enlisted, and I didn't have enough time, so I've had to come in today to do it. So I will now go home and edit this all together, and hopefully by Monday, you'll be watching this. Anyway, predictably, I am still very bad at ending these sign-off segments, uh, so I will let you get on with your day now. Thank you for giving me so much of your time in watching this video. It does mean a lot that you're here at the end. Anyway, I hope you have a lovely day, enjoy War Thunder, and I will see you next time.